Let's design the galactic line. I've written a lot of essays about this, but I haven't done any videos about it recently, so let's do some videos about it. What is the galactic line, and how does it play? Well, I've talked about it as being the Sims in space. But that's really a very bad description, it's just there's no better descriptions out there. It doesn't play anything like The Sims. It has the same focus, though. The Sims is focused on the individuals and their lives, and so is the Galactic Line. It's focused on your crew, and the way your crew lives, and who they are, and what they mean to each other, and the adventures they go on. So, in that way, they're very similar, but they don't play at all the same. And I think it's easiest to explain how the Galactic Line does play if we compare it to how The Sims plays. So in The Sims, the thrust of the game is that there is this massive time compression. Every second is absolutely critical. Um, every day is precious and it passes really, really fast. So all, everything gets compressed down. It's all about time management. And uh, that means you live through every second of your Sims life in fast forward. There are some good and some bad things about that, but regardless, we are going in the opposite direction. In the Galactic Line, you don't have too little time. You have too much. It takes weeks for you to get from planet 1 to planet 2, and months to get to that neighboring star. You're not going to want to live through all that time. Even if you could, you know, live through it on fast forward or whatever, you'd lose all the details. It would just become this mush of, oh look, the characters are still wandering around their standard, you know, jobs. It's super dull at that uh, at that sort of scale. So how do we make it interesting? How do we bring the focus down onto the individual crews and onto their lives and onto their relationships? We don't live through the whole arc. We only live through specific moments. These are kind of like scenes in an adventure game or subplots in a Star Trek episode maybe. Uh, and they are not time sensitive. So once you're in one of them, you have as much time as you want uh, to go and do the stuff you want to do during it. There's no pressure to get it done as fast as possible. But what, ex what exactly are these? What sort of things are we packing into our timeline and how do we distinguish them from each other? How do we create them and why are they interesting? Well, if you've ever played The Sims, you know that there are times when you want to throw a pool party. So you set up a party and you make sure that all of your people are healthy and don't have any overwhelming concerns and they all go to the bathroom or whatever. And then you call other people over and you have to sit there and wrangle the party and be like, okay, well now I've got to talk these three people together and I've got to make sure that these people get along. Uh, I want to hook these two people up and I've got a mission from the game to get five numbers for this guy. Uh, you know, and I've got to make sure there's food out there on the table. Um, got to make sure nobody gets so tired they collapse or whatever. So during this party, you're focused. Some parties are really rough. They're hard to get done. You have a lot of things you want to do and not much time to do them with. And suddenly someone gets sick or something. Other times the party's like, yeah, I just need a couple of little things. So I'm going to throw a party, get that stuff done. And the party can just go on as it, as it likes naturally. The critical thing here is that even though you are super focused during these moments, during these evenings or days, you're still allowed to do any of the things you can normally do. You're not given like special party-based commands. You can go to the basement and paint. Um, you can make a cake. Uh, you can leave for work. You can change your outfit. You can fight. You can quip. You can date. You can do anything you want. That you could do in the normal game. And it's just that you're focused on the fact that there's a party and there are objectives that you want to accomplish. Maybe there's some that you have made for yourself. You want to hook up Anne and Bob. Maybe some are implied by the game. You know, this person needs five more names in order to get promoted at work, five more uh, people in his contact list. Fine. Those are all valid and they're reasons that you focus on having the party go smoothly. But they're not new commands or constraints on what you're allowed to do. They're simply obvious things that you should do. Well, that's the same thing here. Each of these events is not like um, a puzzle in, a, in an adventure game. It's, it's a party. It's a, it's, a, it's a pool party. There's something going on, and your people are involved. 
and you have some things that you probably want to accomplish. Some of those things are going to be based on the situation. Some of them are just going to be your personal preferences and your personal interests. Time doesn't pass, not in any significant way, during these events, because there's so much time, there's not even any reason to keep track of it. But um, things do have limits. So if you were trying to hook up Anna and Bob, you could start the ball rolling, but there's only so much you can do during one scene. So then you have to come back during another scene and come back during another scene and you know steadily work towards your overall objectives. Of course, the individual scenes don't care about Anna and Bob's love life. All they care about is the underlying event, whatever that happens to be. And what is that event? Well, the Galactic Line has three major kinds of play. This is the one that is the most important, but it also has construction and mission choosing. Construction is when you build your ship or your station or your colony or whatever. And mission choosing is when you choose what missions to go on and where to go and what to do. Those things combine to give us a very nice set of missions with very specific parameters. For example, you built a ship. This ship has planetary scanners on it, but no spare power. It's got just enough power. You have chosen to go and scan a planet. The scanning the planet mission takes this long. During that mission, there will be a complication. That is this. Congratulations, we now have the underpinning for our event. There's a mission going on, there's been a complication. If there's three missions going on, they'll often combine complications to create really, really, really nasty complications, really complicated events. Now, what is that going to be? Well, because of the complication engine, which I can go into greater detail later if you guys want, but uh, it's, it's not that interesting, really. The complication engine just says, okay, well, what are we trying to accomplish with this mission? And what sort of resources generally get used? Uh, and what is the ship short on? And it just works backwards. And then it says something like, okay, well, you're scanning a planet. But, you know, your scanners are uh, interrupted or are damaged or screwed up by the fact that your power is not very good. So you've got wobbly power. And it's arbitrary. If you had more than enough power, they would have found something else to throw at you. Uh, but the point is that some shortcoming or some opportunity within your uh, whole overall arc has been discovered. A combination of the things you've built and the things you've chosen to do have uh, have come together and some sort of flaw has been presented. So you're thrown into your ship, you play the captain, and your crew members are uh, trying to do this scan, whichever crew members you've assigned to it are trying to, do, trying to do this scan, but they can't do the scan because the power is wobbly. That's your pool party. You've got to figure out what you want to do about it, you've got to push for some kind of resolution, and you've got to do anything else you want to do while you're there. Now, there's no, there's no specific best outcome. This is not a puzzle. Your power is wobbly, and there are a million possible ways that you could resolve that. But what does this do? How does this allow us to get more play out of our game? How does this allow us to look at these characters and to feel that they are people and to feel that they have lives and relationships and are going on adventures? How does that work? Well, in most games that have random crew, they all are basically the same. So for example, if you've played RimWorld, it's really hard to tell the characters apart in any sort of meaningful way, uh, and they don't really have a lot of personal arcs or adventures or anything. As you go through the game, they're just more interchangeable tokens. You might remember one or two of them from time to time, but most of the time they're just a blob of human resources. So, how do you make characters that are distinct? Well, there are a couple of methods that are used by the Sims, and we're going to use them as well. The first thing is you've only got a couple of characters. You've got, like, you know, no more than seven. Now, you could have hundreds of people aboard your ship. Most of them are going to be red shirts, but during any given scenario, you're not going to have more than seven important characters. You're probably not, probably not even going to have more than six 
uh, and I'll adjust that as needed. But basically, you're not going to have a lot of crew interfacing with you at a named character level very often. And that includes things that aren't crew. For example, if you're having a problem because you're docked with a space station, um, you might have space station characters and they have to be established as well. So that would add into the limits. You, you would have like three of your own crew members and three people from the space station or something. To keep these characters as distinct as possible, there are some things besides how they look. There are how they, there is how they interact. So you have a couple of different things to keep track of when you are managing interaction. The first kind of interaction is interaction with the world. So these characters interact with the world in different ways. Some of them might like to paint. Some of them leave for the day and don't get back until the evening. Some of them are children and can't do anything useful. Some of them might, uh, might practice guitar or garden. Um, so they interact with different things in the world with a different level of priority. And in more recent Sims games, this has been played up with things like take an evil shower. So how you interact with the world adds a lot of flavor. But more importantly, there is how you interact with the other characters. How the characters interact with each other allows them to show their personality and their relationships and what they value, what they don't value, what they like and what they hate. Um, if you have Anna and Bob and they get along great and they get married, then they're always going to be spending time together and you'll know that Anna and Bob are a couple. And you'll know what kind of couple they are because are they a flirty kind of couple? Or are they totally passive about it? Um, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of couple. Uh, and, you know, if two people get in an argument, if Bob and Clyde don't get along and become bitter enemies, you can tell their personalities by how they play that up. If Bob is an evil genius and he doesn't like Clyde, Clyde's probably going to run into a lot of anvils falling on his head. I don't plan on doing this the same way as The Sims, but this basic idea is what makes this approach that I've taken so powerful, at least in theory. When we get one of these events, we have a couple of things we can do. One, we can hook individual characters up with pieces of the event or potential pieces of the event. So for example, we might get Anna as the scientist. And so she's involved with the scan that's being interrupted. And then we might get Bob as the, uh, as the power engineer, you know, your, your engineering team. And he's concerned about why the power is wobbling. And then you might have Clyde, and he's running some kind of holographic simulation over here that's eating up all your damn power. Very basic setup, right? And then over here you might have, I don't know, Dougie Doug, and, uh, and he's actually just here because there is a potential conversion uh, of resources that you might want to use in order to resolve this situation, but I'm not going to go into that right now. S basically, you've got the main cast, and then you've got some extras that might be useful, and the extras might be fairly involved in the same way that during a Star Trek episode, Riker shows up. Riker might not be key to resolving the episode, but he might, and who knows? He's at least going to provide you with some good background. So that's the basic idea here. You've got people who are directly involved with the situation, and you've got people who might be involved if that's something you want them to do. Now remember, you're allowed to interact with these people in any way that is normally allowed. So you can try and resolve this problem by talking through it or by dragging people from place to place or by replacing parts or whatever. Um, or you could invite them out to dinner and hit on them. Or you could phaser them. You can do anything you want. You can set them up. You can tell you can tell Anna that she should probably read up more on power systems so that she can avoid this in the future. And that'll put her on some kind of power research path that will unfold in the future and make her some kind of composite power engineer and scientist. There's a lot of options. But this is all in how these characters interact with the world. And it's very basic. This is not something where a lot of complexity is put into this new... There's not really much nuance here. Anna is the scientist. She is, therefore, the person who was doing the scan. She is, therefore, the one that is annoyed that the scan is interrupted. Bob always handles the engineering stuff. Therefore, he is the one with the interrupted power. That sort of stuff, right? The key here is that this gives all of the characters some reason to relate to each other in a very concrete way. This is happening, 
And therefore, Anna has an opinion about Bob, and Bob has an opinion about Anna. And Bob has an opinion about Clyde, and Anna has an opinion about Clyde, and Clyde has opinions about both of them. They're related because they're all involved in the same event. So this gives them an opportunity to talk about each other. This can be easily tempered by their personalities and their current relationships. So Anna is maybe, if, if she and Bob aren't close, maybe you talk to Anna and she's like, God damn it, Bob will not let me scan properly. He's not taking care of the power generators properly. It's all just wobbly power. I, I cannot stand this guy. If, if she's nice, she might say it a different way. If she's a telepath, she might say it a different way. If they're close, if she and Bob are a couple, she might be like, I've talked to Bob about this, and he says he doesn't know what's going on. From the perspective of what actually gets said, these two things are not terribly different. In one of them, Anne is just being prickly, and the other one, she's not. In both cases, she's saying Bob should be doing something about this, but he's not. It's just how she says it that allows you to get a good read on what sort of person Anne is, what she's responsible for, and what's going on, and what her relationship is with Bob, all at the same time. This gives us a very, very, very powerful way to quickly explain who each character is and what their relationship is to each other without any stress, without any difficulty. We just, they narrate what they would narrate, and because the scenario is set up such that they would narrate the things you need to hear, they narrate the things that you would hear. This is, uh, on paper, a really good way to do it. I haven't managed to do it in a video game yet, just because it requires several moving parts. Uh, those moving parts being the construction engine and the mission engine. But I think that it's going to work out pretty well, and I think you're going to like it a lot. The point here is, in order to make your crews interesting, you have to be able to get close to them. You have to be able to talk to them and hear them talk. They have to have concerns. They have to have opinions about each other. And all of that stuff has to be natural, has to flow unforced. So how do you do that? You set up a scene where it flows unforced. That's the theory. Let me know what you think, uh, if you understood or didn't understand. I can go into details about specifics, but um, a lot of it is pretty dull, because it's talking about stuff in the background. Let me know.